three thirty. <laughs> Just as you run away. <laughs> Sorry. I just have the best lab in the world and they brought me a coffee. So oh, wonderful. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Are you ready to get started? I am. All right. Uh, well, welcome everyone for joining us today for HMSC's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center located in Newport, Oregon. And I will be your host for today. Um, we do have your cameras mics and screen shares turned off right now. Um, if you can leave them that way for right now, that would be great. But um, use the chat box to put in any questions that you might have for today's speaker and we'll work through them at the end. Uh, Want to let folks know that we're also recording today's talk. And so I'm putting into the chat right now where you can find that um, in a few days, probably Friday afternoon, I hope, um, you'll be able to see that recording. Feel free to share that recording, watch it again. If you're so excited to, to learn all this or if it goes too quick, um, it's a good place to go back in and get some um, more detail. Quick little announcement for us. Um, just wanted to promote next week's seminar on January 27th. We have Nathalie Kiros, a postdoctoral research from NOAA's Southwest Fishery Science Center, who will be here to talk to us about future changes in eddy current kinetic energy in the California system, California current system. So join us for next week's talk when we're already to the end of January. I don't know how that happened, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll see you again next week. It will also be another fully remote um, talk, so you'll be able to join us on Zoom. Um, if you need any information about upcoming events, go ahead and log on to HMSC's homepage, scroll to the bottom, there's a calendar of events there, you'll be able to click on that calendar um, and see any of the login details, dates, any of those kind of things that you might need for any upcoming events. But for today, we're very excited to have our speaker, and I'm actually going to hand this off to Taylor Chapel, who is the lead PI of the Big Fish Lab, to, to introduce today's speaker. So, Taylor. Great. Thanks, Cinnamon. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Taylor Chapel. I am an assistant professor um, out at Hatfield. I'm part of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station, as well as the Fisheries Conservation, Fisheries Wildlife and Conservation Sciences Department. Sorry, new name still getting me. Um, and as Cinnamon said, I'm, I'm the, the head of the Big Fish Lab. And Alex um, is a Seacoast postdoctoral fellow um, who just joined our lab just a few weeks ago. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with Seacoast, uh, SECOS is the Cooperative Institute for Climate, Ocean, and Ecosystem Studies. Sorry, I had to write this down so I didn't get it wrong. Um, it's basically, it's a new cooperative institute consortium between the University of Washington, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and OSU. Um, and its purpose is to address the increasing number of climate, ocean, and coastal challenges uh, that really demand a wider collaborations and sharing of that scientific knowledge. Um, and so as far as I know, Alex is our first um, SECOS uh, postdoctoral fellow here at OSU. Um, so a huge congratulations to, to Alex. Uh, and, and she is truly a trailblazer. And I'm sure she's going to set a um, pretty high bar for, for any fellows to come after. Um, because like so many great scientists and so many great marine scientists, she comes from a really well-known uh, sort of marine science hotbed, um, the state of Ohio. <laughs> um, those of you that don't know, I also come from the state of Ohio, so Ohio is really kicking out marine scientists left and right. Um, but she did just recently earn her PhD just a few weeks ago um, from the annual behavior group uh, at UC Davis. And so Alex's previous work um, aimed to understand life history, things like behavior and movement survival as consequence of their biotic and abiotic environments. Um, and besides being an avid soccer player and scientist, Alex is also a really incredible science communicator. Um, she leads courses and trainings and discussions on um, effectively using outreach and communications really to increase not only the impact, but the footprint of our science. Um, some of you might have noticed that the Big Fish Lab now has an Instagram and Twitter accounts. Um, thanks to, to Alex. I'm terrified of both of those things. Um, but uh, she's really a, a really incredible resource for um, sort of branching that between science and the, and the community. Uh, so today I think she's gonna talk about some of her very cool graduate research and a bit about her current and future work here at OSU. So 
Uh, like everyone else, I'm excited to hear Alex today, but I'm even more excited to have her as part of our community here at Hatfield. So Alex, let you take that away. Wow, thanks, Taylor. Um, I think Ohio is not kicking out marine scientists. I think we are leaving um, for good reason. There, there's not very many oceans there. But anyway, um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you about my PhD work and a little bit about my postdoc. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to be discussing using a multi-scale approach to understanding fish responses to environmental change. And as Taylor said, I'm coming from California, so a lot of my work was done in uh, California ecosystems. So Taylor did a lot of this intro already, um, but because I'm new, I just wanted to say, you know, hello, and, and I'm excited to be here. Um, I, as Taylor mentioned, actually just finished my PhD in December. My background is in fish physiology and behavior, although you will see some species distribution models here too. Um, and I've been really fortunate to be able to travel globally, really, to study sharks specifically. Um, and I've also had the benefit of having a lot of amazing collaborators and funders, as you can see here. Um, and now I am thrilled to be part of the Big Fish Lab. And really, we just developed a logo, so I needed to put this out there because I think it's awesome. Um, um, so yeah, I'm thrilled to be part of this lab now, and I'm really excited to see the research that comes out of it. Right, so I'm going to start by saying something that I probably don't have to convince you all of. Climate change is happening, and we see this through a lot of different examples worldwide. We see more extreme weather events, increasing water temperatures. And simultaneously, we're also having perhaps more directed human impacts on certain ecosystems, right? Landscape development, direct exploitation of resources, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And animals and other organisms have to learn to cope with these changes. But determining organism response to environmental change is really complicated. And it's rendered even more so in environments that we cannot consistently observe, like underwater. And part of the problem too is that animals and species don't exist in isolation, right? They're constantly responding to stressors, multiple stressors, and simultaneously they're interacting with other species or organisms that might be responding in different ways to those same stressors. And so as a result, we might expect their response to a given stressor to be complex or counterintuitive. And we need to consider that when we're thinking about being more proactive with their management. So to kind of show you what I mean, take this hypothetical fish in this hypothetical blue habitat, um, that fish might be affected physiologically by something like ocean acidification or global warming. And we might predict a response based on that. Maybe we expect the fish to leave this now subpar habitat, but maybe it's not leaving because it can't, for example, we need to consider the fact that the habitat might have been altered. We need to scale out from that physiology. Or maybe this now subpar habitat has more prey items for that fish or fewer predators, right? So we need to consider multiple scales of environmental stressor to really get a good idea of how we can predict fish responses to these collective stressors and environmental change. And to do that, we need to combine studies looking at different resolutions. So that's what I did for my PhD at UC Davis. Um, I studied three different systems in California, and today I'm going to tell you three different stories about them. But my general goal was to develop methods and explore how organisms might be responding to environmental changes in ways that we don't expect and why that might be. So perhaps not surprisingly, I thought about each of my chapters in terms of scale. So we're going to start with physiology. Um, in the Central Valley of California, which is actually where Davis is located. So that's a very local ecosystem to me. We're then going to talk a little bit about the effect of environment on fine scale movement behavior in San Francisco Bay. And finally, we're going to scale completely out to look at population level distribution at the largest scale um, response to environmental change in the California current ecosystem. So to the Central Valley we go. Um, and I do want to say that this study was conducted with the help of the Delta Science Fellowship and a ton of amazing collaborators who I've listed here. Now, the Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta that flows through the Central Valley is a highly modified waterway system, and it's home to a variety of different types of wildlife, including four runs or populations of salmon. Yeah, I'm sure you thought I was going to start with sharks, but I am not, actually. Um, 
Now, for those of you who are not super familiar with salmon life history, salmon exhibit freshwater and uh, saltwater life stages. So here in the Delta, they will hatch and grow um, up river in their natal habitats. And then at some point they will out migrate uh, to the ocean where they will grow more and spend some time. And then they will return back to their natal habitat in order to spawn. So as you can imagine, the Delta is a very important habitat for them. However, populations here have been declining over the past few decades for numerous reasons. And there are ongoing efforts to determine kind of these underlying causes driving these declines. Now it's been suggested that this is all happening because of decreased survivorship of outmigrating juveniles. And that pattern seems correlated to temperature. So on that top, that top panel here, what you're seeing is survival probability on the y-axis and time during the outmigration on the x-axis. And those different colored lines indicate different outmigration routes. What you can see in the middle there is that dip in survival probability, and that corresponds on the bottom graph to an increase in temperature. Now it's been suggested that because salmon occupy cold water habitats, perhaps their thermal physiology is to blame, right? They simply can't handle those warmer temperatures. But both the study I'm about to show you and others suggest that this might not be the case and actually salmon appear more thermally robust, uh, more capable of tolerating these warmer temperatures than we had initially expected. So there's been another hypothesis recently proposed instead. We know that there are a lot of different predators in the Delta, which are already a huge source of mortality for salmon. So maybe predators at warmer temperatures are more active and have higher metabolic demand. So in other words, perhaps it's not the effect of these warm temperatures directly on salmon. Maybe it's indirectly affecting the physiology of their predators, which is causing that top-down effect on the juvenile salmon populations. So that was the basis for the question of this study, which is how does temperature affect predation risk in juvenile salmon here in the Delta? But before I get into that, I'd like to talk about why temperature is important. So temperature is what we consider a master uh, environmental factor because it influences both physiological and ecological outcomes, particularly for ectothermic species like these fish that I'm talking about today. Temperature influences an animal's metabolism which correlates to the amount of energy that that animal has for maintaining its basic maintenance costs of so just existing, plus any extra fitness enhancing activities that animal needs to do, like growing or avoiding predation or migrating. And in turn, we can actually measure the impact of temperature on an animal's metabolism by looking at its physiological performance in the lab. And that is what we did as part of the study, and I'm going to show you in just a moment. But you can imagine that at an optimal temperature for a given fish or species, we would see a more efficient metabolism, so an increase in the amount of extra energy available for these fitness enhancing activities, and an improved uh, physiological performance. So that was the basis for my hypothesis as to what's going on in the delta. That is, I thought that a thermal metabolic advantage might be driving these patterns. Um, and that is just a really jargony way of saying that at warmer temperatures, warm water predators would outperform cold water salmon and vice versa. So it's this physiological advantage conferred by temperature for predators or prey, depending on what temperatures we are talking about. Now to test this, I looked at first two different runs or populations of salmon, fall run and late fall run Chinook. Um, this actually allowed us to compare between really closely related populations of the same species. Then we selected three different predators to examine. Striped bass and largemouth bass are known to be huge sources of mortality for salmon here. Um, rainbow trout, not so much, but they're also salmonids. And so we thought that perhaps their physiology would be really closely related to that of the salmon. And they would offer a unique contrast to these other two predators, which are primarily warm water adapted. I do just want to note that only two of these are actually native to the system. That is the salmonids. So you can see on that little California insignia there. Um, I'm not going to talk about the native versus non-native implications here, but they are certainly there. And I'm happy to answer questions about that um, after the talk. So for the study, we kept all of our fish at 18 degrees Celsius for the entire duration. And that is because that temperature represents 
did not represent an extreme in terms of thermal tolerance for any of these fish. So it was kind of a good middle ground temperature. And there were two steps here. First, we had to identify the optimal temperature for each of these species. So determine their thermal physiology. And two, then determine whether that thermal physiology affected the outcome of predator-prey interactions conducted across a spectrum of temperatures. And we predicted that our salmonids, so our Chinook salmon and our rainbow trout, would be cold adapted, would do best, perform physiologically best at colder temperatures. And I should say the temperatures we selected for this study ranged between 11 degrees and 25 degrees, um, which were reflective of the uh, environment that the fish would experience normally in the Delta. Now, striped bass tend to occupy mid to warm range temperatures. They kind of roam throughout the Delta's channels. So we thought that they would do better at our mid to warm range temperatures. And largemouth bass are pretty warm water adapted in the sense that they occupy really near shore habitats in the Central Valley. And if you've ever been to the Central Valley, you know they get quite warm. So we thought that they would do better at our warmest test temperatures. So for part one, uh, I want to just say two things. First, the striped bass did not like to cooperate. Uh, they were really easily stressed by the procedures I'm about to show you. So we actually could not uh, measure their thermal physiology in any way. Second, for the duration of this talk, I'm going to refer to um, fall run Chinook salmon with that little leaf and late fall run Chinook salmon with the little hipster beanie, just to differentiate those illustrations. So earlier I told you that we can look at physiological performance in a lab to see the effect of temperature on metabolism. And the way we do this, the first phys physiological metric we were interested in was called aerobic scope. Now aerobic scope is calculated as the difference between maximum metabolic rate and resting metabolic rate. And it essentially correlates to the amount of extra energy that animal has after accounting for its basic maintenance costs for those extra fitness enhancing activities, right? So to, to calculate aerobic scope, we had to calculate maximum and resting metabolic rate. And we did that using a fish tunnel, like the one you see here. So this is a large mouth bass in our tunnel. And the way that this works is we put a fish in the tunnel at a given temperature. We then seal the tunnel and there's an oxygen probe in there. And for maximum metabolic rate, we swim the fish to exhaustion, just like on a treadmill, right? Um, and that gives us maximum metabolic rate. So how much oxygen can the fish consume when sw swum to exhaustion? Um, and for resting metabolic rate, it's almost exactly the same procedure, except for this time we let the fish rest. So there was no swimming. How much oxygen does the fish consume at that temperature at rest? So this is really good for looking at things like steady state swimming or endurance. But in a predator prey situation, we thought that looking at escape and attack response might be more realistic. Um, and so fish are likely to be bursting in those situations. So we decided to measure burst capacity. Now, what I will say is that uh, burst ability is really hard to study and many physiological studies don't do it. So we ended up having to build a customized burst tunnel as you can see on the bottom schematic. Um, so here, this consisted of a tunnel with two chambers. Uh, essentially, you'd put a fish in the chamber and stimulate that fish to burst through a series of lasers. And those lasers were set at predetermined distances. And every time a fish broke a laser, it was tied into some code in Python, we'd get a reading of the time that fish broke the laser. So distance over time, we could get fish speed for each burst. And you'll see that there's a chamber at the other end too. So we could actually burst the fish back and forth until they were exhausted. So that gave us two different metrics, right? Burst speed and the number of repeated bursts that the fish could do um, at a given temperature. So what that might look like in real life, and this is slow-mo, and I hope it goes through because I was having problems with my PowerPoint crashing earlier. So this is a rainbow trout that you're about to see swimming through the burst tunnel. And again, they bursted much faster than this. This is very much slowed down. Right, so what did we find here? Remember that we thought that largemouth bass would do best at our warmest test temperatures. So for aerobic scope, I'm gonna show you a few different graphs of this. So I just wanna orient you now. What you're seeing on the y-axis is the amount of oxygen that that fish could consume. And you are seeing our test temperatures on the x-axis. 
Maximum metabolic rate here is marked in blue, resting metabolic rate in orange, and aerobic scope, which is the difference between those two, is marked in black. So we're paying attention to that black line. And it's significantly increased with temperature. So that fish could consume more oxygen at these warmer temperatures, as we predicted. And you're seeing burst speed on the top graph here and the number of burst events on the bottom graph as a function of temperature. And the relationships were significant in both of these cases in the ways that we predicted. So they could burst faster at warmer temperatures and they could burst more. So all in all, largemouth bass seem to do really well at these warm test temperatures. Now for rainbow trout, we thought that they would do really well at colder temperatures. And for aerobic scope, that's not exactly what we found. There was a significant relationship between, between temperature and aerobic scope. Um, however, you're seeing that black line peak at around 18 degrees. So that was kind of our middle ground temperature. Um, so colder than the largemouth bass, but still um, not as cold as we had anticipated. And interestingly, neither burst speed nor the number of burst events was significantly affected by temperature. So they seem pretty thermally robust in terms of bursting capacity. Now, to look at the salmon, remember we thought that they would perform pretty, pretty similarly given that they're just two populations of the same species and we thought that they would do best at our cold test temperatures. Um, spoiler alert, our results really surprised us. So for aerobic scope on the left, you're seeing late fall run salmon, and there was no effective temperature on their aerobic scope at all. On the right, there wasn't a significant effective temperature, but in the opposite way we predicted. So they could consume more oxygen at warmer temperatures. And it got even more complicated because when it came to burst speed, late fall run on the left this time had a significant relationship with temperature that increased so they could burst faster um, as temperatures increased the opposite of what we had expected. And fall run this time showed no significant effective temperature on burst speed or burst number. So fall run seemed affected by temperature in terms of aerobic scope, but not in terms of burst ability. Late fall run this time though, could burst more at colder temperatures, even though they could burst faster at warmer temperatures. So what do we take away from that? There was a lot of variation between both species and populations. We then needed to determine which metrics were most informative and in telling us at what temperatures salmon were likely to be eaten. So to look at that, we conducted a series of predation trials. So for each of these trials, uh, a predator and 12 different salmon were placed in a tank, like the one you see on your left, and they were left there for 48 hours. And at every 24 hour mark, we would count the number of salmon that had been consumed at a given test temperature. So we conducted these across different test temperatures. And I should say that due to fish availability in year one, we tested largemouth bass with late fall run salmon. And in year two, we tested our other two predators. We brought the striped bass back in um, with the fall run salmon. So what you're gonna see in these graphs are the number of salmon eaten over the entire 48 hour period on the Y axis and our test temperatures on the X axis. For largemouth bass, they significantly consume more salmon at warmer temperatures, which is pretty reflective of what we saw with largemouth bass physiology. For striped bass, we did not have the physiological data for them, but there did not seem to be a significant effect of temperature on striped bass predation. Um, certainly more work needs to be done there in terms of looking at the physiology as well. Um, but anecdotally or qualitatively, I guess we saw more consumption happening at all but our lowest temperature. And for rainbow trout, uh, they did not seem to like to consume salmon at all actually during the trials, which was really interesting considering that they were pretty ravenous when they were in the tank um, and we were feeding them salmon otherwise. So we have a lot of zeros here and there was no signif significant effect of temperature here either. Um, although whether that was due to their hesitation to eat anything um, or an actual result is hard to determine. So there was one physiological metric whose relationship with temperature seemed to match that that we saw in the predation trials. And that was the number of burst events. So what you're seeing here is the largemouth bass and the late fall run matchup in the predation trials. And here, largemouth bass could burst more at warmer temperatures and late fall run could burst more at colder temperatures and more salmon were consumed at warmer temperatures and fewer at colder temperatures. 
For the fall run and the rainbow trout, both of these species seem pretty thermally robust in the sense that the number of burst events seem unaffected by temperature for them. And there was no significant effect of temperature in the predation trials. Again, this is hard to say whether this was because the rainbow trout were hesitant to eat or whether predator and prey were actually pretty evenly matched in terms of thermal performance. Now for the conclusions to this study, Predator thermal physiology definitely influences salmon survivorship to some degree based on our results, and that definitely depends on the species you're looking at. So for largemouth bass in particular, um, that seemed really true. I will say largemouth bass are already um, a huge source of mortality, so this is definitely something to consider in the future. And as you can see on that bottom right hand graph by Michelle et al. in 2020, people are already starting to think about this. How do we map predator hotspots across a landscape or a waterscape like the delta? Um, and what you're seeing in those different colors there is the predator hazard ratio. So those lighter colors are higher predator hazard ratio. Um, and so if we know that, you know, largemouth bass are better suited to these warmer temperatures and might be more active there, we can start to map out those predator hotspots based on something as simple as temperature, which should be pretty easy to map out. However, I do also think that we need to be careful when extrapolating from physiological studies to ecological outcomes. Um, and I suggest that we're really selective in metrics that reflect the behavior of the situation we want to assess. So for example, aerobic scope didn't seem to be a good predictor of the outcome of predation trials, but bursting might offer a really good look at predator-prey interactions. Right, so in chapter one, we looked at physiology, temperature, trophic interactions. So for chapter two, we're gonna scale out and up a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna take you to the San Francisco Bay Estuary to look at fine scale movement of a larger fish. And again, I wanna acknowledge my collaborators here and the Aquarium of the Bay uh, in San Francisco for providing uh, the funding and logistical support for this study. So the San Francisco Bay is the largest estuary along California's coastline, and it's a really dynamic environment. It experiences a mixed semi-diurnal tide, so that's two different high tides and two different low tides per day. Um, and so that's a lot of water moving in and out, particularly underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, which essentially serves as a funnel for that water. Um, simultaneously, there's a lot of human activity in this area. So there's dredging, there's coastal development, and all of that is also altering the bathymetry um, and the landscape around here uh, through which that water is flowing, right? So animals in this habitat have to learn to cope with this really dynamic place. Among those uh, are the seven gill sharks. So, and I, I should say, I'm sure you're gonna hear a lot more about this coming out of Taylor's lab because this is definitely a species we hope to study more. But seven gill sharks are apex predators here, even though they're not super big for a shark, they're about five to seven feet in length. And they feed primarily on fish, although they're also known to feed on marine mammals here. Um, so this is clearly a foraging ground, at least some of the year for them. And it's also one of the only known pupping grounds for this species. So there are a lot of baby sharks here as well. Otherwise, we know very little about what they do in this habitat. We do know they like to hang out at the mouths of these bays, including the San Francisco Bay. They seem to like this high flow area, although we don't know how they move through the area or why they're there. And without basic information on their habitat use and movement, we really have limited ability to infer what their role as predators in the ecosystem might be. So my initial question for this study was pretty simple. How do sharks respond to the movement of the tide in the San Francisco Bay estuary? If they like to be where water is moving, how do they respond to that? And could we use this to predict how they're responding to human induced changes in the area or gain any other insight as to how they might be using this habitat? So to address this, um, I used active tracking data that was collected in 2008. So for active tracking, essentially you catch a shark, you put an internal transmitter surgically inside and that pings every second. When the shark is released, you can lower it into the water and you can put a receiver in the water as well from the boat, rotate the receiver back and forth and listen for the source of the strongest signal. And doing that, you can actually follow the shark for a pretty long time, although that is really hard to do. Um, and so I actually took advantage of a data set that was collected from 2008 of three different sharks um, collected in the late summer and fall. And as you can see from those tracks, the sharks seem to like to hang out underneath the bay. 
or underneath the bridge. And so my hypothesis here is like, if they're hanging out in this high flow area, they must be going with the flow. Like clearly it's going to be too energetically costly for them to swim against the current. Additionally, if I think that they're trying to go from one habitat to the other, from the ocean to the estuary, maybe they have to swim a little bit faster in weaker tides. So our low high tides and our high low tides um, to get from point A to point B. But if the tides are really strong, the highest high tides and the lowest low tides, um, maybe the sharks don't have to move at all. Maybe they can just take advantage of that, you know, movement of the tide in and out of the bay and save their energy by not swimming very actively. So my second prediction was then that um, their response would depend on current strength. Oh, did that? Interesting. Is that showing for you, Cinnamon? No, we just got a little yeah. swath. Okay, are you seeing that now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, everyone. So that was what I was expecting, but determining this turned out to be a challenge. And so this actually became more of a methods paper. Uh, and that was because of the scale of environmental data that was available. So just as an example of this, we had a hypothetical shark and a hypothetical shark track um, over the course of say a day. And we have tools already like satellite imagery that can give us you know, an averaged uh, context for that movement track. So what's going on over the course of the day, roughly over this whole movement track. Um, and that might be really useful if we're looking at things like changes in global current patterns um, and, you know, predicting what the effect of climate change on ocean current systems might be. But animal movement decisions are made at both small and large scales. And so that sort of environmental context is not very informative if we want to know what's going on in that particular moment for the shark to turn or that one or that one. And frankly, collecting that data while you're actively tracking sharks for four days each is really hard to do. So we decided to develop a method of retroactively contextualizing animal behavior. And that was through the use of a hydrodynamic model. So these are models of water flow in both two and three dimensions, and they incorporate information on bathymetry and the harmonic constituents of the tide. So that is the position of the earth, sun, and moon relative to each other. And they're not often used uh, to look at animal movement, but you might have seen them to um, predict the trajectory of oil spills, for example, or to see um, the paths of sediment transport. So the way that this worked for us is we had our animal movement tracks and we overlaid a fitted grid on top of the shape of the seafloor here. So it was fitted to the bathymetry of the bay. And at each of those points, those are nodes out of which you'd have a vector. So an arrow indicating the shape and direction, uh, or sorry, the strength and direction of the tide at that point. And so we could calculate those vectors for every second along the, the shark's path or the shark's tracking uh, period. And we could make an animation. And it looked something like this when we overlaid the animal movement on top of that model. So what you're seeing here is um, that that orange and yellow dot is a shark. That, so that's a shark being actively tracked. And that red underneath the Golden Gate Bridge is really bright because there's a lot of water moving in and out of there. And that just there is an instance of the shark moving with the tide out of the bay. So we built three of these models um, for each of the sharks that were tracked. And we could conclude a few things. First, we were able to see that seven gill sharks seem to go with the flow a majority of the time. In over 70% of instances, they were going in the direction of the tide underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And as you can see on this title chart, each of those numbers corresponds to a time when the shark went underneath the bridge. Um, and so if I color code this, you can see that the purple corresponds to when the shark was in the estuary, the green corresponds to when the shark was in the ocean, and that gray area indicates when the boat lost the shark, because let's be honest, that totally happens. Um, so we did not want to infer anything about the shark's behavior if we could not see it. But you can see, particularly in port 3.1, for example, that as the tide is going out, as the tide is dropping in the bay, um, the shark is moving from the estuary to the ocean. But 
we did not find any evidence that their response was dependent on current strength. So what you're seeing on this chart is shark displacement over the entitled entire tidal cycle um, on the y-axis and the current displacement in the shark's location over that cycle on the x-axis. That dotted line would indicate a one-to-one -one relationship. So if the shark were completely to be passively transported by the current at its location and move exactly as far as the current had taken it, that point would be on that line. We also looked at whether the phase of the tide mattered. So, you know, did they respond differently to ebb versus flood tides? And the answer is no. So we see points above the line. There were instances where the shark moved further than the current would have taken it. And there were instances where the shark did not move as far as the current would have taken it um, in that location. So admittedly, this study brought about a lot more questions than answers. What we did find was that hydrodynamic models are really successful at contextualizing animal behavior, and they're a super cool tool, um, very accessible and, and very easy to see visually. So it's a really interesting tool to use in the future. Um, however, there's a lot of questions as to why the shark is not going with flow in these locations, why it might want to get from point A to point B from the ocean to the estuary and back. And so I think that the next steps for using these models are also incorporating information on prey movement and abundance. So maybe the shark's not going with the flow because it can swim against the tide because it's about to take advantage of a meal that will offset that energetic cost. Um, looking at the energetic cost of swimming against the tide, is it really that costly? Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, these tools can be used in three dimensions. So looking at whether vertical habitat use also affects the direction um, that that shark is moving. That would be really interesting. Okay, so we went from physiology to fine scale movement. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about population distribution. Um, and this chapter would not have been possible at all without my collaborators at NOAA. So I'm super grateful for them. All right, so for those of you who are not familiar with this fish, this is the basking shark. Um, it is the world's second largest fish. It is the size of a small school bus, which is why the school bus is there. Um, and it can travel the world. So it can traverse entire ocean basins. Now, what you're seeing here is the shark filter feeding. So they are megaplanktivores and they feed on calanoid copepods often at the surface of the water. Now, although they can travel vast distances, basking sharks are also known to gather seasonally in pretty predictable locations that we call hotspots. And those hotspots occur in Ireland, the coast of Canada, New Zealand, and the United States, and that includes the California current ecosystem. Now, there are two prevailing hypotheses as to what's driving um, hotspot formation. And the first is that sharks are coming to these areas to take advantage of um, seasonally abundant food sources, right? So they're often seen feeding in these locations. But they're also seen exhibiting these really interesting coordinated swimming behaviors, like parallel swimming, as you can see on the upper right. They also do nose to tail following. They swim in these massive circles, not really feeding. So it's thought that this might also be a good time for this otherwise very migratory animal um, to potentially mate with other individuals or socially learn. Um, that's something I'm also hoping to get into a little bit during my postdoc, maybe, fingers crossed. Um, so there might be a social aspect, there might also be a feeding component, and likely it's a little bit of both. Regardless, um, the seasonal abundance of sharks and their habit of feeding at the surface has rendered them a really easy target to fishing efforts and eradication efforts worldwide, particularly in the middle of the 20th century. So what you're seeing on the left two panels here are images from Ireland's Ackle Island fishery. Um, this fishery was most active probably in the early 1900s till about 1980, um, catching up to 1,000 sharks per year. And they were fishing them primarily for their liver oil, although um, they've also been fished for their meat, as well as, of course, their fins. On the right, there was a really unique case up in British Columbia of these sharks being so abundant as to be caught in salmon nets and considered a pest species. Um, and so from 1940 to 1970, the Canadian government enacted a culling program for them. And what you're seeing is an, a depiction of an anecdotal story where the government boats essentially had razors at the front of them and would drive through shoals of sharks. Um, evidence of that is mixed, but it's a really interesting story. Regardless of eradication method, basking shark numbers seem to have dropped 
um, likely as a result of these combined efforts. And as of 2019, they were considered endangered, so they have not rebounded. Now, a lot of what we know about basking sharks comes from the North Atlantic, where they're still seen pretty regularly. Um, we know very little about what's happening here on the West Coast of North America. What we do know is that basking sharks used to form hot spots up in British Columbia um, during the summer months, and then they would be seen down off the coast of California and Monterey and, and Morro Bay, as well as even Baja, California, um, during the winter months. So they were thought to be a, a single migratory eastern North Pacific population. And based on the literature that does exist, there, have, there seems to have been two trends characterizing this population recently. First, numbers seem to be declining. So there's not been any formal stock assessment of basking sharks, but um, this model from McFarland et al. 2009 was based off of sightings data, um, which and projected that shark numbers have been dropping since the middle of the 20th century, interestingly corresponding to the Canadian government culling effort. Um, and then on the bottom, you're seeing pictures or a graph from 1948 to 1950. This was aerial spotter data, and you're seeing peaks in sightings in the fall and spring. So that was pretty common when they were seen in California in the middle of the 20th century. But what we're seeing now is a seasonal shift. So since the 1990s, sharks have been observed primarily in California during summer months, whereas they used to be seen in Canada during those times. So the question is what's going on? And the purpose of this study was really to synthesize what we know. What are the sightings trends in basking sharks in the California current ecosystem? And could they be driven by environmental changes? So there's been no habitat modeling here. We don't know what environmental changes they are responding to at all. To address these questions, I took advantage of two different types of data. The first was aerial survey data that was collected from 1962 to 1997. So these were NOAA spotters looking primarily for bait fish. Um, and what you're seeing here, all those points were areas uh, that were surveyed at least once. And anything red, no basking shark was ever observed. Anything yellow, a basking shark was observed at least once. Now, because that only went to the 1990s, we also looked at an opportunistically collected data set from 1970 to 2018. These were from people reporting basking sharks from whale watching vessels, um, tagging schemes even, or other NOAA surveys. And I should say, because this data set was primarily opportunistic, we relied pretty heavily on the aerial survey data, but the opportunistic surveys, because they went or the opportunistic data because it came so close to the present offered um, good insight into what's been happening in the past few decades. So to look at this first question again, and I do wanna say this, we did not do any sort of population modeling or stock assessment here. We very simply looked at the sightings trends in basking sharks here. Um, and we divvied them up by aerial survey and opportunistic data because they were collected differently, but they tell a really interesting story. So those upper two panels show the total number of sharks sighted on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And what I think is interesting is the orders of magnitude difference between those two axes, those two y-axes. In the aerial survey data, we see as many as 4,000 sharks sighted in a given year in the 1960s, um, and then another small peak of over 1,000 sharks in a year in the early 1980s. In the opportunistic data, we never see more than 60 individuals cited in a given year, and that was in 2011. There's certainly a lot of variation, right? So that we're not seeing thousands of sharks every year um, in the aerial survey data, for example, and that's pretty characteristic of the species, even from reports in the North Atlantic. But it's still really interesting to think about just the, the order of magnitude drop that we are seeing in the number of sightings observed. Now on those bottom two panels, remember I told you that we thought that this hotspot formation and these coordinated swimming behaviors might indicate that these hotspots are important for the life history of the species and perhaps for reproduction. We also decided to look at group size. Maybe this decline in the population, if it exists, is happening because of something like an ALEA effect. Um, and we saw very similar trends. So not only are the sightings declining from the aerial survey data to the present, but so are the numbers in groups. So you might see as many as 500 individuals in a given sighting um, in the 1960s and again in the 1980s, and you never see more than 10 in a group in the opportunistic data, which was really interesting. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus primarily on the aerial survey data. 
The question then is like, we see these trends and these changes in sightings data, could they be driven by environmental changes? To look at this, I used a species distribution model, and I'm gonna walk you through how that worked pretty quickly. We combined our aerial survey data, with, which had presences and absences, um, with the in a model with the environmental variables we were interested in looking at. So these were selected primarily based on the Baskin shark literature elsewhere, but we wanted to see if prey abundance and temperature, these local cues might have affected basking shark presence or probability of sighting. Um, so we looked at chlorophyll A, surface chlorophyll as a proxy for prey abundance and sea surface temperature. We were also interested in whether climatic variables like um, El Nino or the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, these larger scale climatic factors were affecting basking shark sightings. We included pilot as a random effect in our model to see if there was any potential for observer bias. Um, we also looked at year and seasonal changes just to see if there were these other temporal changes that were happening independently of these other environmental variables, particularly given the fact that recently we've been seeing basking sharks in the summer months. So we combine all these into a general additive model and produce these response curves, which show the probability of shark sighting as a function of our environmental variables of interest. And for our local cues, both, both emerged as significant. So sea surface temperature and chlorophyll both seem to significantly affect the probability of basking shark sightings. They seem primarily to be observed at colder temperatures and at higher chlorophyll, indicating more plankton, not surprisingly. So this is somewhat reflective of what we've been seeing in the literature in the North Atlantic and elsewhere. And I should also note that all of our other variables were also significant and I don't have time to get through them all. Um, so I just wanted to note that there, but I'm happy to answer questions about that after the talk. But the two I wanted to talk about were that our model picked up this, the peak in sightings in the early 1960s and the 1980s. Um, our model suggests that those peaks are independent of these other environmental variables, which is really interesting. So that might actually be a population level phenomenon. Um, and then we did see seasonal changes. So in the 1960s, which you see here in red, um, there's a peak in sightings in around March and again in around August. And then in the 1970s, the probability of sighting shifts to later in the fall and later in the spring, and it shifts back in the 1980s. So there's something driving these seasonal shifts as well, even up until the 1990s, because remember, we did not include our opportunistic data here. Um, that I think needs to be more examined because this is happening independent of those other environmental variables. Now, finally, we were also able to look spatially at what was going on um, using our general additive model predictions. And just to orient you to this, the colors you're seeing are our model predictions. So anything in red indicates higher probability of sighting, anything in purple indicates no probability. Um, and those black dots indicates areas where the sharks were actually observed um, rather than our model predictions. So in the 1960s, you're seeing an environmental hotspot for them in Monterey, high likelihood that they will be there, as well as the central California coast. Um, that shifts dramatically in the 1970s. So our model predicts that they're more likely to be down actually near Baja, California, and even into Santa Barbara. No likelihood of seeing a basking shark in the central coast. But that goes back up again in the 1980s. So we're more likely to see more sharks in Santa Barbara then, um, as well as even in Monterey and the central coast. So the conclusions for this study, which was actually just accepted for publication earlier this week, so hopefully I can share it later. Um, but basking shark populations here seem to be declining and have been since the 1980s. Again, we did not do the stock assessment, but all evidence in the current literature also points to this trend. And based on the decline in group size that we also saw in our sightings, this could be due to something like the Ali effect. But it's certainly almost, it's almost certainly related to um, the culling efforts and the fisheries, which also occurred in Monterey and Morro Bay um, in the middle of the 20th century. We saw that like elsewhere, large and small scale environmental variables seem to affect their distribution, which is not surprising, but something we should pay attention to, especially in light of climate change, which of those variables are likely to change the most. And finally, we advocate for further monitoring of sightings, which is hard because we see so few of them these days, certainly not enough to build a research program off of. Um, and because they're so large and migratory, we definitely think that they are leaving the protective jurisdiction of the North America 
and uh, perhaps encountering other sources of mortality in the high seas. So we need to monitor uh, shark fin markets and really keep track of where those sharks might be encountering those other sources of mortality. Right, so in conclusion, a lot of researcher conservation practices to date are based off of studies of large scale animal responses, population level, these models like what I just showed you. But I've hoped that I've convinced you that it's really worth looking at multiple scales of environment or responses to environmental change to get a good idea of what's happening at these scales and how we can be more proactive um, for conservation of threatened and mobile marine fishes like I showed you today. Now, I don't, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but I do just want to say I'm, I've am i come here well, with the Seacoast Fellowship, which I'm really thrilled about, and so obviously I'm working with Taylor. I'm also mentored by David Huff at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, um, and the project that I'm about to show you could not be done without a billion different collaborators, um, many of whom I've listed here, so I want to acknowledge them as well. But for the next two years, um, my goal is to look and see what the effects of salmon sharks in the Northeast Pacific ecosystems, what effect they have on local salmon populations. So perhaps you can see a theme in my PhD and postdoc research. Um, just very briefly, I don't have a lot of time, but many stocks of salmon are heavily managed and some are rebounding, um, but some are not. And the question remains why that is. And in particular, Chinook salmon, uh, again, theme in my research, um, they seem to be declining in spite of really strict quotas and um, other management efforts. As you can see on this old burger figure, the catch is declining in spite of pretty constant releases. And there's been a lot of attention recently as to whether predation might be a factor that we're not considering properly in our modeling or stock assessments. Um, and so a lot of uh, research focus to date is on marine mammals or even birds. And a lot of it is also focused on the freshwater life history stages of the salmon, like I did for my first chapter. Um, however, we think that salmon sharks might be posing more of a risk um, for salmon that are actually out at sea. And so that is what I'm hoping to look at for my research with Taylor. Um, this is a salmon shark, and I don't have time to go through these slides, but um, our key questions are what are salmon sharks eating and how much, where are they, how often do they overlap with primary salmon habitat, and we're going to be using stomach content and stable isotope analysis, um, some biologging to look at energetic uh, requirements for salmon sharks, maybe some population modeling, looking at catch per unit effort data, uh, and then more species distribution modeling um, using existing sources of data as well. So I know that was a lot and I'm here now, so I'm happy to talk more about that project later, but for now, um, I will go ahead and just take any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, yes, that was a lot. And so there's a lot to process here. Um, I'm starting to see some questions uh, Greg, this is a long question. Hang on, let me sort through this. Yeah. All right, so Greg, I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and let you ask this question verbally. Hang on just a second, and I will allow you to unmute if that's okay with you. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks, Alex. That was a great uh, presentation. Really a lot of information and some innovative work. My question has to do with the basking sharks and the data that you presented, um, especially the aerial survey data. As I recall from that graph uh, that you showed, the y-axis showed the total number of sharks mm -hmm. um, it, it, for the aerial survey stuff. And so I guess the question that I have is how equal are the number of flights, the hours of flying, the total distances flown, and the spatial distribution of those flights over the time period on the X axis? In, in, in simple terms, are these numbers actually comparable metrics among the years? Yeah, thanks for that question. That is a question I got during my defense, actually, and it's something that I've thought a lot about. Um, this was a really complicated data set to work with. Obviously, it was not collected with the purpose of seeing basking sharks. And so we actually have a figure in the paper showing the distribution of the flight time for each of the pilots that actually ever reported a basking shark. 
Um, and they were not equal, and that's certainly something to consider. And it was really important because pilot emerged as a significant source of variation for us in our models, which suggests that whoever the pilot was had a really important impact on our model results. And that's something we discussed in a lot of detail. Um, I definitely also do not think they're comparable between the aerial survey and the opportunistic survey. I mean, for anyone who's done aerial surveys, you know you can see things that are different than someone with binoculars on land or on a boat could be able to see. Um, so those are definitely important caveats to these results. But based on current literature as well, um, with other systematic aerial survey data, they've started to see these declines using really systematic methods, even starting in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and anecdotally, I don't think we've seen more than one or two sharks in a year for the last decade since I've been paying attention. So. Thank you. So okay. Greg, can Thank you go you. ahead and mute yourself again? Uh, we get a little bit of background noise from your mic. And then Michael, I see that you have your hand raised. Do you wanna go ahead? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, hi, Alex. Um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, so my question was about your first chapter. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess your predators, uh, as I, it was really complicated, so I might get a bit mixed up, but it seemed like your predators um, behaved difficultly and were not consistent with a lot of your predictions. And I was a little fascinated by the rainbow trout um, mm -hmm. in, in that they didn't seem to behave like a cold water species. Is, is that what you, you found? Yeah, that is, I would actually probably agree with that. Um, in particular, their burst ability seemed incredibly thermally robust. Um, so they did not behave, yeah, as we would have predicted. So um, I guess I just wanted to ask you about, you know, I'm a geneticist and study salmon a lot, I've done it for a while. And what's so interesting about rainbow is that they are the most cosmopolitan salmonid in the world. They are all over the place. And um, I actually come from South Africa and they are trout there too, which is a lot warmer. And mm. so my curiosity was, do you know what stock you were working with? Because that may be a reason why they were not what you expected. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, that chapter was frankly way, the results were way more complicated than we had expected. You know, the initial design was like, oh, we're going to see this and this. And we did the largemouth bass trials and they seemed pretty straightforward. We we're like, this is going to be awesome. Um, but yeah, the rainbow trout were interesting for a variety of reasons. I don't have the stock off the top of my head. They were hatchery fish um, that we acquired from a, I think it was a pretty local hatchery in Northern California. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the stock in particular because we got them from someone who's using them there and we reared them. Um, we reared them at about, we kept them at cold temperatures until about three weeks before the trial started. So they were reared at about 11 to 12 degrees Celsius. Um, but yeah, so I'd have to look more at that, but it was also interesting because it wasn't just the rainbow trout. It was also like the salmon that were not performing at those cold temperatures the way we had expected either. Um, so I, I can get back to you with the stock of the trout because I think that's probably very important. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Emily has a couple of questions here. I'm gonna read you one of them and if we have time, we'll go back to them. But she's asking if um, for the basking sharks, could the shift in season um, be due to the changes in their distribution across the three decades? Yeah, that's such a good question because I think about it that way also. Um, when I was looking at you know the spatial distribution shifts, and how the 1960s and the 1980s seem really similar to that of the 1970s. Um, I think that that is probably definitely related um, because they were seen later in the spring and later in the fall in the 1970s than they were the other two years. But related to the previous question, I do also think be, we have to consider this with a grain of salt because that could have certainly also been a product of the effort. Um, and with these sightings data, it's almost always impossible to like really say one or one way or the other, especially with a data set like this, because the effort was not as consistent as we would have wanted it to be. So um, I definitely think that those two things are related and I'm still trying to figure out how. Um, but yeah, I think that that is something that I've been thinking about as well. Okay, and um, another one of Emily's questions goes back to the rainbow trout. Mm -hmm. um, is there a chance that the aerobic scope is not the best metric for identifying thermal preference? Yeah, 100%. Okay, so I, and 
you know, I think aerobic scope is a really common, and I was, I'm, I was not a physiologist before this project. So I'm still, it's still weird for me to think about myself being a physiologist, but I see aerobic scope often reported in, um, it, when people are talking about fundamental thermal physiology and part of the project, the burst tunnel really arose because we didn't think it was going to be an accurate representation of what these fish were going to be doing. Um, and anaerobic and aerobic capacity might differ a little bit depending on the thermal tolerance of these fish. So it's definitely possible that aerobic scope is not the best metric for identifying thermal performance. And there's been so few studies on burstability. There has been a few, particularly for rainbow trout. Um, but I definitely think that more studies need to expand their kind of physiological repertoire when we're looking at these different metrics for sure. Okay. Um, and then uh, Alex, can you put up your email address again? Oh, yeah. I think you had it on there. Um, I just wanted to let folks know um, that if you were interested in working with Alex on the, her uh, project where she's here at Hatfield, um, you might be able to reach out to her. She just put her information into the chat. Um, as I have told both Alex and um, Taylor, I'm so excited about this study. I love salmon shark and I'm really excited to see what you all find. Um, but I think there's some others around that are also interested in that. So if you're interested in collaborating, uh, Alex's information is in the chat. If you would like to watch this again, because it was definitely full of lots <laughs> of information. Um, like I said, the recording will be up in a little while. Um, so just uh, either reach out to me and, uh, if you're not sure where to find that, otherwise you can go on to the website and find it under our past seminar page. Alex, thank you so much. Um, we'll have you back when you get a little bit more information about the salmon shark. We'd love to see a follow-up on that. And for everybody that is online, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you next week. And again, fill up, follow up with Alex if you have questions. And Alex, you're getting a whole bunch of thank yous and Zoom uh, claps coming into the chat. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Alex. Bye now.